Wow, what, a, what an awesome song. You're the one who never leaves, the one behind. Pastor Brett, you are, you are my favorite singer. It, uh, yeah. And I'm your favorite preacher, I'm just telling you that. Used to be Elvis, but it's his, so you've done really well, son. You've done really, really well. Well, uh, someone left me a note in the pulpit this morning that says, don't mess up. How many think Pastor Weaver would be capable of doing that? Actually, now Pastor Jeff would never do that, but any of the other staff members quite capable of doing that. So thank you for a very timely note. I appreciate it. Well, I don't know about your place, but I, we got an inch of rain at my house last night, sorely needed, much appreciated. The grass has already responded. It looks like a brand new yard, and boy, I'm so thankful for it. Uh, a good inch of rain and a whole lot of thunder. How many heard the thunder? How many thought it was thunder and you just realized your husband was snoring again? Yeah, not good. Well, Carolyn uh, heard I was preaching today. If you don't know who Carolyn is, that's my wife, 49 years. She heard I was preaching today, so uh, she left town. Uh, actually, she's been at a wedding this weekend. Uh, she, I'm, you could say by marriage, we have a nephew who lives in Nebraska, and he married a young lady who lives in Pennsylvania. You know, that never works. <laughs> Pastor Brett is from Nebraska, and his wife, Julie, is from Pennsylvania. Uh, see, I told you, never works. Uh, actually, that one's working out quite well. Isn't it amusing? Do you ever think about this? It's, I find it so amusing and amazing who God brings together and how he brings them together. And that is a worthwhile subject, but I don't want to talk about it today. I don't want to talk about marriage, though marriage matters matter. I don't want to talk about God's leading in our lives, though there are a few subjects that could be more important. I want to talk today about Jesus. Who is Jesus? Who did he say he was? What does the evidence tell us? Turn, if you would, in your Bibles or look at the overhead, John chapter 6, verse 35. John, the 6th chapter, verse 35. Then Jesus declared. I like that word. There was a proclamation element to his words. Jesus declared like a prophet standing tall and strong, knowing exactly what he's talking about. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. Astonishing statements so easy to miss in a superficial read of this text, but we'll go back and examine them. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. Well, today we begin a series of messages on the I Am statements of Jesus. We're calling this series, Jesus Is. The I am statements of Jesus as recorded by John in his gospel, John, dear friend, devout disciple, 
and apostle of Jesus Christ. We'll be taking a look at eight of these I am statements, seven of them recorded in John's gospel, one last one in John's book of Revelation. And it's my privilege to get us started today, to get us started with verse 35. Jesus' declaration, I am the bread of life, that is a strange statement, isn't it? But strange doesn't stop there. He surrounds that claim with several other claims that caused a ruckus and a revolt on the part of some, in fact, many. So this is, uh, I'm just warning you up front, this is not one of those how can Jesus make me feel good sermons, not one of those sermons front-loaded with talk and treasures of blessing and abundance. This is a sermon all about Jesus, all about Him, who He is and what He says. And it's a sermon built around two simple but incredibly thought-provoking questions. The first question is, what did Jesus claim? What did Jesus claim? In verse 35, I am the bread of life. Now, every one of these I am statements go back, take us back, take us way back to the Old Testament, to the book of Exodus, to the time when God revealed Himself to Moses, and He commissioned Moses to go and stand before Pharaoh, Egypt's Pharaoh, and tell him, let my people go. Moses didn't want anything to do with that. He quivered and quavered, and he began to make one excuse after another, and the summation of his excuse-making was, but Lord, who am I, and and who are you? And God said, I am. I am who I am. And what we might not see in the English, but is much clearer in the Greek, is that when Jesus says, I am, He's speaking just like His Father. He's laying claim to His deity. He's he's taking us all the way back to Exodus. I am. I am the eternal I am. We'll hear Him say, I am the light of the world. I am the gate or the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the one who was, the one who was to come. And now he says, I am the bread of life in verse 35. Well, bread is pretty much a staple of life wherever you go. Most any culture has a form of bread. And of course, nobody outdoes America. In America, there's option overload, as in most things. You can go to Subway, and you'll be faced with the decision of a possible dozen bread options that can make your sandwich and hopefully your day. Italian, flatbread, Monterey cheddar, Italian herb and cheese, nine-grain wheat bread, honey oat. Some stores, that ain't enough, so they add rye bread, jalapeno cheese, which I want to try sometime, Parmesan, oregano, roasted garlic, rosemary, no thanks, and sea salt. So if you like bread, I recommend Subway, and I don't get a cut on this, okay? And if you hurry, you can get there by noon. Some of you are saying, if you hurry, I can get there by noon. I'll hurry. So Jesus is using really every day universal language, bread. But he's using it in a way that has never been used before. I am the bread of life. You can't live, not really live without me. Now, what a statement. What kind of person would say that? 
That's the point. Who is he? What is he? Liar? Lunatic? Or Lord? He's not through yet. He's got a lot more to say in this chapter. Here's another claim. Not only does he say, I am the bread of life, but he says, I have come down from heaven. Look at verse 38, if you would. Verse 38, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Go back to verse 32. I tell you the truth, it's not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven. It is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Verse 41, at this the Jews begin to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I I came down from heaven? This just drove people crazy. I, I love it when Jesus drives people crazy. And then he said, I will raise up all who come to me. Look at verse 39. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise raise them up at the last day. And he reinforces that as if they might have not heard. He said in verse 40, My Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. There are some highly educated but not so intelligent people out there who say that Jesus Christ never claimed to be God. None are as blind as those who refuse to see. None are as deaf as those who refuse to hear. Have they never opened their Bibles? Have they never bothered to read the Gospels to see what Jesus actually said? I'm sorry, but how can smart people be so stupid? He said, I am. I am the bread of life. I have come down from heaven. I will raise up all who come to me. And then, to add to that, repeatedly he says, I give eternal life. Look at verse 27. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you on him. God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Once again, look at verse 40. He says, everyone who looks to the Son, believes in Him, shall have eternal life. In verse 47, he says, I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, and they died, but here, here standing before you, is the bread that comes down from heaven which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Wow. So what did Jesus claim? I am. I am the bread of life. I came down from heaven to take you to heaven. Feast on this bread and you will never die. First question. What did Jesus claim? Secondly, why should I believe him? After all, others have made similar claims. Why should I believe Jesus? What makes him any different? What evidence does he bring? Well, that's an important question, and I consider it the most important. And I'm happy to tell you that he answers that question, and he produces a boatload of evidence that back up his claims. In fact, he said, look, look at my life. Look at it under a microscope. Examine all the nuances of what I say and what I do. Check me out thoroughly. Believe me, not just for what I say, but believe me for what I do. 
Believe me, not just because of the words you hear, but because of the wonders you see. We need to be reminded, and we need to be ready to remind those who would question us. Christianity is not some blind, baseless leap into the dark. Christianity is not built on sand. It's not a house of cards that can fall at any time at the first snort from a skeptic. Christianity is built on a Jesus that stands up under the most severe scrutinization, a Jesus who the more you look at him, the more you're inclined to fall on your knees and say, my Lord and my God. Now, keep in mind, Jesus is just getting started. We're only six chapters in. And as his ministry will continue, there will be miracle upon miracle and reason upon reason to believe him, to believe what he says. And even now, in the early stages of his ministry, the picture is becoming clear. This is no ordinary carpenter. This is no ordinary rabbi. Well, this is not even an ordinary prophet. I get a kick out of how people try to deal with Jesus. They try to categorize and minimize him in a way that makes them comfortable, something they can live with. After all, who wants a God in the flesh? That's so disturbing and threatening. It's just too close for comfort. So, they say, well, Jesus was was a good man. Jesus was a great teacher and a philosopher. Jesus was a moral moral example. Jesus was even a prophet. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure Jesus appreciates your gracious evaluation. But let me put that back on you and say by your own confession, if Jesus was a good man and if Jesus was such a good teacher, and if Jesus was a prophet, maybe you'd better listen to what he had to say. In fact, maybe you better listen very carefully to what he had to say. And maybe you should look at the evidence he so clearly and purposefully gave to back up his extraordinary claims. So, let's look at what's been going on and what has led to this point of our text. If you go back in John's gospel, you can see what has transpired. I would take you back to the opening verses. I'd take you back to the, the encounter with and the testimony of John the Baptist. John was a Baptist. We love him anyway. We love all Baptists. We, in fact, we love John's preaching too. Because it sounds, sounds like us when he preaches. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. It sounds sort of like us, doesn't it? In the first chapter of John's gospel, John the Baptist identified Jesus. He pointed him out and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Sounds like us, doesn't it? So we like John. Jesus, this good man, this moral example, this great teacher, how did he respond when John pointed him out and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? How did this prophet, this good man, this moral example, how did did he respond to John's preaching and teaching? Well, he didn't say, Now, John, you need to tone this down. I didn't, miss, I didn't intend to mislead you, John, but, but you're mistaken. He, he didn't say, John, I, I didn't come to take the world's sin away. I, I'm a sinner myself. He said nothing like that. What he did say is that John has testified to the truth. What he did say was that John was a lamp that burned and gave light. Not only what did Jesus say in response to John, what did he do? He got in the water, and he submitted himself to water baptism by John's hands. How many have ever wondered why Jesus 
bother to be baptized in water. After all, Jesus had no sin. Jesus had no reason to repent. So why would he be baptized in water? Well, certainly he did that as an example for all of us, but there's, there's a lot more going on than that. You see, by coming to John, what a visible expression he is giving. When he comes to John and he submits to John's water baptism, Jesus is endorsing John as a prophet. He's endorsing John's message. And what was John's message? It was Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So by coming to John, Jesus is giving public announcement to the fact John's got it right. John is right about me. John is a true prophet. And at that very baptism, the Father spoke from heaven and the Spirit came from heaven and remained on Jesus. So the genesis of his public ministry, quite dramatic, quite arresting. What happens next? Well, John chapter 2, he goes to a wedding. Jesus goes to a wedding in Cana and he performs his first recorded miracle. And let me just say, as kindly as I can, let me just say, you party poopers who think Jesus never laughed and Jesus never had a good time and Jesus didn't have a sense of humor, get a clue. Hello? He turned water into wine, people. And the guests went crazy over it. Where did you get that wine? Wow, this tastes like it came right out of the Garden of Eden. It's, it's, it's heavenly. And his first miracle contributed to a celebration in life. Lie, a laughter and love and life. I know some Christians, you wouldn't want to invite them to a party. Not if you wanted the party to stay a party. But after this, I got a feeling that Jesus had no problem being invited to parties. Hey, you're invited to our party. Is Jesus going to be there? Yes, sir. I'm in. (laughs) Then we have him visiting the temple. And most of our Bibles have a heading, the cleansing of the temple. Now, yeah, I guess you could call it that. He went to the temple and he saw the abuse and the extortion that was going on, the tyranny, the hold of the Pharisees and the religionists. And so he just quietly sat over in a corner and started making, fashioning a whip. He stood up and then he sprung into action. He drove out the money changers and he cleaned house because it was his house. And when the crowd demanded, who are you? He told them. He said, here's who I am. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it again. And John says the temple he spoke of was his body. So early in his ministry, Jesus is predicting his own resurrection. Then we move into the phase in chapter 3 of his teaching ministry. Two candidates, two recipients of his teaching. One was Nicodemus. He tells Nicodemus, Nicodemus... My friend, you're religious. You're so religious. Makes me sick, Nicodemus. You must be born again. You must be born again. And he tells him what his church has been trying to tell people ever since. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall never perish, but have everlasting life. Then in chapter 4, he has an encounter with a woman at the well in Samaria. She was a woman. In that culture, strike one. She was a Samaritan. In that culture, strike two. She was a sinner. Strike three, you're out. And there at that well, Jesus 
tells her, you're never out. He tells her that He is the Messiah, and He offers her the water of life. Yes, look at His life. Examine it. Give it the utmost scrutiny. Watch Him as He gets up and He sits down. Watch Him when He moves out and when He comes in. Watch Him when He speaks. Watch Him when He touches. Everything He says, everything He does tells us who He is. And beyond that teaching ministry, He then goes into His healing ministry. In chapter 5, He he heals a lame man. I love the way he does it. He'd not been, the lame man had not been able to walk for 38 years. Jesus shows up. No hocus pocus. No abracadabra. No, but just one command. The Bible says the man was healed. And he picked up his mat. And think about it with legs that had not walked. In 38 years, he walked out of there, and he went home, and he danced with his wife all night long. Doesn't say that, but (laughs) wouldn't you? Jesus, he's on his way. He's fulfilling his destiny. The miracles will flow. Blind eyes will be opened. Deaf ears will hear. Leprosy will be cleansed. The lame will walk. The dead will be raised. And then we come to chapter 6. He borrows a fish sandwich from a kid and feeds a crowd of 5,000 plus. And after that, the people wanted to make him king. Their imaginations ran wild. Think of the government handouts with a king like this. Need more food? Just tell the king. Need better health care? Oh, this king can fix that in a hurry. Need a new house? Man, he can build one for you in three days. Need more money? This king has a money tree and a golden goose. Jesus for king. Jesus retreated from that. He retreated to a mountain to be alone because he didn't come to be an earthly king. He came to be an eternal king. And when evening came, the disciples left him, and they went across the lake. They looked for him, couldn't find him, but they, so they left and went across the lake. And there you have that picture, disciples, boat, oars, but no Jesus. They got out on that lake, and a storm came up. It was bad. The winds were strong and the waves were rough and no Jesus. But then something happened. The Bible says they saw Jesus approaching the boat. and He wasn't in a boat. They saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water. And they were terrified, more terrified of this water-walking Jesus than they were of the storm. He got in the boat and said something like, hey, guys, come on. You're all a bunch of scaredy cats, just me. So that's what has brought us to this text today. Why should I believe him? (laughs) Well, many reasons, but some of it has to do with water. Water turned into wine. Water walked on living water. Water, when you drink it, you never thirst again. And some of it has to do with bread. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. Some of you will not understand this, but I'm just just not much of a bread person. I'm a meat and potatoes kind of guy. I'll admit, because there are witnesses who have seen this, once in a while when I go to Olive Garden, pardon the plug, I'll, I'll indulge in some bread scarfing. But for the most part, bread is something I can do without. It's something there to help me shovel my food onto my fork. But when I was 17, 
this unchurched lad discovered a bread that I fell in love with. I can't even tell you how good it is. Better than mama's biscuits. Better than mama's cornbread. I'm not saying something. This bread satisfies. This bread comes from heaven. This bread is the bread of life. Jesus is the bread of life. Evangelism has been described as one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. That's what I've tried to do today. Let's pray. As we bow our heads, close our eyes for a brief moment, dear friend, all I can do is stand up here and tell you what I've experienced and what I've learned, and I would point far beyond me, and I would point to the countless numbers who have said I was seeking and I found all that I was seeking for when I found Jesus. I found bread, and now I'm, I'm, no, I'm not hungry anymore. I found water, and I'm not thirsty anymore. He, he is everything He claimed to be. He fully satisfies. And if you don't know Him today, today can be that day. In fact, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. It says now is the acceptable time. So if the Holy Spirit has dealt with your heart, moved upon you, if He's pulled back some blinders so that you see what you didn't see, put your life in His hands. Just say, Lord, I I receive you as my Savior, my hope, my life, my Lord. The transformation is His. You don't have to change yourself. He'll do it. If you make that commitment today, tell somebody. In fact, I don't know how you could, but tell somebody. We have a Fresh Start Center outside these doors. You can stop there and receive helpful information, give you direction as a follower of Jesus. Lord, I thank you today for such a startling scene where Jesus stood before many who were hostile critics, and yet without compromise, without an iota of cowardice, our supremely confident Lord declared, I am the bread of life. God, I thank you that that bread is a part of my life. I thank you for all the saints who know what I'm talking about. I thank you for the miracle of redemption. Greater than a leper healed, greater than a a lame man walking, greater than a blind man seeing. the miracle of anyone in Christ becoming a new creation. Yes, it has everything to do with bread and water. 